Anyway, so we are starting chapter 19, which is the last uh, story uh, in the book of Judges. It takes the last uh, uh, 19, 20, and 21. The last three chapters uh, of the book of Judges is all around the same story. It's a story that we refer to as the concubine in Gibeah. And uh, it's a terrible, terrible story from beginning to end. There's so many parts of it that are terrible. Uh, and it's in a way, you know, if we talked about uh, the book of Judges beginning on a very optimistic note with so much promise and so much potential and the various leaders and, and, and you know, here and there, the nation kind of slips and then they come back and they have different leaders with different, you know, um, levels of, of righteousness. But as we get to the end of the book, we have seen that things are beginning to slip. And these last two stories, the one we read, uh, the last two lessons about Micah and his little and his temple and his idol and all that. Uh, and this that, of course, is 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 problematic in a number of ways. That, but this one just goes beyond anything that we have seen until now. Now, there's a question, of course, and we raised this before. When do these two stories take place? Both the story of Micah and this story of the concubine in Gibeah. When do they take place? And there is a theory that they actually took place at the beginning of the period, uh, not at the end. And one of the, the reasons for that is we see uh, if the civil war that kind of uh, comes from this uh, is that in the next chapter, we see that they go to Phineas. Phineas is mentioned, they go to him and they're, ask, they're trying to, through him, get, get a word from God. Uh, and Phineas, of course, if it's the same Phineas, Phineas is um, Aaron's grandson. Now the period of Judges covers close to 400 years. So if it, is Finney, if it is Aaron's grandson, it's clearly a story that could not have taken place at the end of the book. It would have more logically taken place at the beginning of the book. But it, even if it does take place at the beginning of the book, the, um, the, it's clear that why it's at the end of the book as a kind of wrap up to the, the, what, what's, what's worse about this period and how just things deteriorated. Uh, and, and some of the worst and terrible things and kind of giving you, uh, uh, and if, if we look at the next book, the book of Samuel, which we will be doing, uh, if we look at the book of Samuel as a book that talks about the beginning of the period of the kings, uh, the crowning of, first of Saul and ultimately of David. Uh, and if we think of the book of Samuel as one kind of upward movement till we get to you know, David, king of Israel, who will then become the eternal king of Israel. Um, that we have, we're going into that book, into the book of Samuel, having reached the lowest point possible. Uh, and that is kind of what this story is coming to tell us, that the, the period of judges uh, at the end of the day reached the lowest point possible. And as I mentioned before, we have three different times in these last two stories where it talks about, and there's no king of Israel, as if to say, this is what happens when there's no king. Everything is just a mess. Wait one second, go away, go away. I'm gonna put silence on my phone. Okay, uh, you know, this is what happens. And that's what, that's really, you know, and so when we see this story as the worst of possible stories, it really is a, a major indication this is the worst it can get. And to, to move us into uh, the book of Samuel where things, of course, start to get much better. Um, okay, let's start. Chapter 19. I'm gonna read a lot of this. We're gonna read inside the text because there's a lot of comments and a lot of things that I wanna point out as we're reading the text. In those days, when there was no king in Israel, a Levite residing at the other end of the hill country of Ephraim took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. Okay, so let's first figure out the, um, uh, let's figure out the geography a bit. Let me see if I have that man handy. Uh, here it is. Okay, and now I'm going to go back to this and I'm gonna share screen and here we are. Okay, you see it? Okay, so you have here, okay. So what you're seeing here is uh, uh, this map and Bethlehem is right over here, okay? 
And Ephraim, in between Judah and Ephraim is Benjamin. This is a very critical piece of geography to understand. Jerusalem is at the border between Judah and Benjamin, okay? And, but just north of Benjamin is Ephraim. And if he's at the other edge of Ephraim, we pick, probably figure he's up here somewhere, okay? And if you'll notice that just north, we have, if we're going from Bethlehem, we're moving north, we see we pass Jerusalem. And if we continue north, we see Shiloh is over here. And that, of course, is where the tabernacle is. And if he's at the edge of Ephraim from Shiloh, he's probably at the western edge out here, okay? So that's just to give you um, a, a sense of, of, where, of where we are, because this geography is going to be relevant, okay? So there's a man who happens to be a Levite. Now, remember, Levites don't have their own, ter their own uh, territory, and therefore, there are Levites spread out all over the place. So this Levite happens to live at the edge, the western edge of Ephraim. He took as a wife a concubine. And that's kind of a contradiction in terms because a concubine is not a full legal wife. So it's kind of a sub-wife, you know? A concubine um, uh, is tied to a particular man, but she doesn't have all the rights and benefits of a full legal wife. Um, that already tells us something. Why does he have a concubine? Why doesn't he just make her his wife? Uh, a man who really wants to do the right thing and be responsible and 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 make sure that his wife is looked after. He gives he he takes her as a wife. So already we have a sense of okay, who is this fella, and what's going on here? And it's very important. Of course, it's easy for us today to pay attention to these details because we know the end of the story. But still, it's it's just amazing how scripture itself kind of buries these hints along the way so that we are astute readers, we can start asking the right questions, okay? So he takes, he has a concubine from Bethlehem. So if you saw that Bethlehem is in the south, okay? He lives further west. He has this woman who's originally from Bethlehem, but she's living with him up in, you know, in Ephraim, which is quite a distance away. Okay, now, uh, once, now at some point his, concubine. Now here I want to, my English says deserted him. It's actually, when we take the word deserted, what is actually happening here is it's giving an interpretation on a word. The word in Hebrew is vatizne. And that word comes from the root znut or zona, which is the word for prostitution or a prostitute. So literally what this is saying is this woman in some way behaved like a prostitute. Maybe she had an affair. Maybe she was running around with all kinds of guys. That is the literal interpretation of this, of this word. And yet in the English, it says, and the English, as well as many, if not most of the classic commentaries do not translate this word as the fact that she was acting inappropriately, but just that she left him. She deserted him. Okay. Um, why is that the case? And I think the context of the story gives us this. Well, first of all, one of the commentators pointed out that the word zan or zana is not just used uh, in the sense of being a prostitute or being promiscuous, but that it means to leave, to go out. And that makes sense even uh, philologically, or however you, you say that word, um, because don't forget, in ancient times, a woman is supposed to stay at home. A woman is not supposed to be gallivanting around the neighborhood. Uh, she's supposed to be staying at home. And of course, this is not how we behave today. Thank God, I don't think I could survive in one of these ancient patriarchal societies. But this is how it was. And therefore, a woman who went out and about freely, too often, whatever, maybe a woman that would be suspected of flirting, having affairs, you know, engaging with uh, strange men, etc. Uh, and I will connect this to something that I find very interesting. It's not a, again, it's, you can imagine, I am quite a modern woman. I really don't believe in women being restricted at home in any way. But sometimes when you're reading scripture, you still, and not just reading scripture, but reading commentaries, you have to keep in mind 
what the context is and what the the position, what you know, how people saw things. So when um, in Genesis, when and I'm just going to find the place in a second. When uh, in Genesis, when um, Jacob is is, uh, is has just returned to uh, to the land of Israel, and he is in uh, in the area of Shechem. We learn. Uh, let's see where it is. In chapter, this is Genesis chapter 34. That Dina, you know, the whole story is the rape of Dina. How does that verse begin? Dina went out to visit with the girls or the daughters of the land. She went out. Okay. Now there are some middle medieval commentators, and I will stress, I do not agree with this commentary, but it is in existence. Medieval commentators that would say, ah, that Dina, she asked for it. Why? She went out. What was she doing? Wandering about, looking for people to be friendly with. She's supposed to stay at home. Okay. So again, it's not a, it's not a um, com commentary that, or a, a you know, the interpretation that I necessarily endorse, but this idea of going out is already being something that might be considered promiscuous is uh, definitely something that exists, whether in biblical times, certainly in medieval times, it's not clear, but this is where this interpretation is coming from. Okay, so let's say that this means she went out or she, and wait, Mike says she deserted him. Also, what is the context? Okay. Where does she go? It says she whatever. And then she goes from him. She leads him to go back to her father's home to Bethlehem in Judea. And she's there for four months. Okay. And then we are in verse three. Then her husband set out with an attendant and a pair of donkeys and went after her to woo her to win her back. Okay. So if this is a woman who had gone out and she was having an affair, so she's playing around, you can't imagine that this guy is going to be going all the way from his home in Ephraim, all the way to Bethlehem to woo, her, to woo her back. He would probably say, a plague on her, what do I need her for? So this is an indication that there was, she didn't do anything wrong. All she did was leave. And in this case, this word doesn't mean, um, you know, that she was playing around or that she was promiscuous, but just that she left. She left, she went out and she went back to her father's home. Now let's go back to um, verse three. Okay, then her husband set out with a, an attendant and a pair of donkeys and went after to woo her and to win her back. Now, as soon as I saw this, now I admit I'm reading it in Hebrew, so I think maybe the words are more similar. I'm not sure if they're as similar in, uh, in, the, in the English. But if I go now to, um, to Genesis 22, it immediately rang for me this this uh, this verse, 22, verse three. So early next morning, Abraham saddled his donkey and took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. I have here a picture of, and some of the words are the same, okay? I have a picture, whereas here we have a man, one young, one attendant and two donkeys, and he's going to bring his wife. And in the case of Genesis 22, I have a man, two attendants, one donkey, and he's going to sacrifice his son. And so I have to ask myself if this isn't another hint that scripture is telling us this man is going to be sacrificed, that woman. Abraham is going with his donkey and the, and the attendants to sacrifice his son. And this man, he doesn't know it yet, but there's almost as if a, a hint that says this man with his donkeys who got up early in the morning and he went and he took his, his, uh, you know, donkeys and his attendant, he's going to sacrifice somebody, which is exactly what happens. He ends up sacrificing this woman. Okay. He gets to their house and we see she brings him into her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, he received him warmly. Now, why? Here you have his daughter has run away from this fellow. She's been in the house now for four months. What, why would the father be happy to see the fellow? So first of all, let's go again to the status of a woman in these times, not really great, okay? A woman who has run away from her husband, doesn't matter what the husband did, a woman is going to be seen as, as something wrong with her. She can't keep her husband. 
She can't, a woman, especially, look, she's a concubine. She's not even a legal wife. She's already at a lower status. But you can say, and this might be why she is a concubine. Maybe for whatever reason, she had trouble getting a real husband. So at least she's a concubine. You can see her father thinking, you know, well, at least she has some rights. At least she has some, a man who is going to be taking with her. She's not on her own, which is the worst possible thing for, for a girl to be. And here, then she comes back home and he's probably in despair for four months. What, what's going to be with her? Is she just going to be on her own? Is she going to be deserted forever? So this guy comes back. On the one hand, he's happy to see him. Oh, you know, I'm, he can, re- by him coming back, to take his wife, or at least to reunite with his wife or his concubine, at least this restores her, his daughter, to some level of dignity. However, you see here, as the story progresses, he does not want to let her go back. I mean, he can't stop it. At the end of the day, this man is the master of his daughter. If he says, let's go, he has every right, because she's his concubine, he has every right to take her. But look how hard he is trying, to, what, what, how he tries, he tries to prevent that departure. Verse four, his father-in-law, okay, and this is also very interesting. The, the English here says his father-in-law, the girl's father, pressed him. In the Hebrew, it's vayichazekbo. He held him, okay? It, it, it's, it's a much stronger description that the father held on to him Okay, and because he really wants to prevent him from leaving. Uh, And he stayed with him three days. They ate and drank and lodged there. Early in the morning of the fourth day, he started to leave. But the girl's father said to his son-in-law, eat something to give you strength, then you can leave. So the two of them sat down and they feasted together. Then the girl's father said to the man, by the way, so the two of them sat down and they feasted together. These two are the father and the son-in-law. The concubine isn't here. She's a piece of property. She's not a piece of property to the father. He clearly is concerned for her, okay? But you can see the conversation is only between the father and this man, his son-in-law. Um, and they sit down and eat together. It doesn't say, it's, it, and it's very interesting because it says two of them together. So the scripture is telling us two of them, not three of them. Okay. Then the girl's father said to the man, won't you stay overnight and enjoy yourself? The man started to leave, but his father-in-law kept urging him until he turned back and spent the night there. Four days already, he's held him back. Early in the morning of the fifth day, he was about to leave when the girl's father said, come have a bite. You see what's going on? This father desperately does not want, his, he, he's happy that his daughter has a his her husband back because that gives her status, but she is he is not happy that they're about to leave. And you have to ask yourself, why did she leave? He must have been abusing her, or at the very least, he was not kind to her. Now there are, the midrash says that um, he found a, a fly in his soup, and he was very angry and very angry at her, and a few other examples like this. Where, well, the Midrash doesn't really know what happened exactly, but the point of the Midrash is that he's being petty. He's treating her poorly. He's not treating her with respect, okay? Uh, two of them ate, dawdling until past noon. Then the man, his concubine, and his attendant started to leave. His father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, look, the day is waning toward evening. Do stop for the night. See, the day is declining. Spend the night here and enjoy yourself. You can start early tomorrow on your journey and head for home. But the man refused to stay for the night. You know, he says, enough's enough. I'm leaving. He set out and traveled as far as the vicinity of Yavuz, that is Jerusalem. He had with him, again, a pair of laden donkeys and his concubine was with him. Okay. Who was who listed first here? The donkeys. Okay. And again, in Hebrew, it's even more more pronounced. It says, with him, with him are his pair of donkeys saddled and his concubine is with him as if she is an afterthought. The main thing is that's with him is his donkeys. He is more attached to his donkeys than he is to his concubine. Since they were close to Yavuz and the day uh, was very far spent, the attendant said to his master, let us turn aside to this town of the Jebusites and spend the night in it. But his master said to him, we will not turn aside to a town of aliens 
who are not of Israel, but will continue to Gibeah. Now, this is very ironic in light of what happens next. They could have gone into Yavuz, okay? But because Yavuz at that time, and we know this, we know this from the beginning of the book of Judges, that Yavuz has not yet been captured. And in fact, the, the person who actually and finally captures Yavuz, which is Jerusalem, from the Jebusites is David, King David. Until then, Jebus is a Jebusite city, okay? It's not yet Jerusalem. And, uh, and so he's uh, concerned, you know, these are foreigners. These are not of our people. He doesn't feel comfortable. He's a frightened. He's not going to go there. Okay. Which of course is a mistake because who knows, considering what happened when he gets to Gibeah, it's very possible he would have done much better had he gone to Jebus. Okay. Come, he said to his attendant, let us approach one of those places and spend the night either in Gibeah or in Ramah. So they traveled on in the sunset where they were near Gibeah of Benjamin. Okay, so they've crossed now. If I said Jebus is the border, Jerusalem is the border between Judah and Benjamin, they have now crossed into Benjamin. And they're looking at these two places, Ramah. Ramah, you might recall, is where Samuel spends a lot of his time. Okay, he's not from there. But as when he becomes a prophet, he spends a lot of time in Ramah and Gibeah. Both are towns of Benjamin that are very close to Jerusalem. They are just north of Jerusalem. Um, by the way, there is, um, there's a Ramallah. You may know that big Arab city, Ramallah, just north of Jerusalem. Right near Ramallah, a small village, suburb of Ramallah is called Aram. Okay, they are both thought to be named after this city of Ramah, which also is just north of Jerusalem. They turned off there and went in to spend the night in Gibeah. He went and sunk in in the town square, but nobody took them indoors to spend the night. They're hanging out there in the town square, waiting for someone to invite them in, and nobody does. In the evening, an old man came along from his property outside the town. This man hailed from the hill country of Ephraim and resided at Gibeah, where the townspeople were Benjamites. So what do we learn about this fellow? He's from the same place as this man the town country of Ephraim, maybe not the exact same place, but he's just from, you know, just north of Benjamin in the hill of Ephraim. Uh, and, and he, but he happens to live in Gibeah. Okay. So what this is doing is distinguishing him. The Benjaminites are not nice people. They are not inviting these people. None of them are inviting these people in. The only person who sees him and invites him in is someone who's not really a local. He's really from Ephraim. He happened to see the wayfarer in the town square. Where, the old man inquired, are you going to and where do you come from? He replied, we are traveling from Bethlehem and Judah to the other end of the hill country in Ephraim. That is where I live. I made a journey to Bethlehem of Judah. Now I am on my way to the house of the Lord and nobody has taken me indoors. The house of the Lord is in Shiloh. And so we saw that on the map, a straight line. Okay, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Gibeah, Shiloh. He would go straight north. He would stop at Shiloh to bring a sacrifice or whatever. And then he would head west to where he's living in Ephraim. We have both brewed straw and feed for our donkeys and bread and wine for me and your handmaid and for the attendant with your servants. We lack nothing. In other words, he's saying to him, I don't need much. I just need shelter. I brought all my supplies with me. Rest easy, said the old man. Let me take care of your needs. Do not on any account spend the night in the square. And he took him into his house. He mixed fodder for the donkeys. Then they bathed their feet and ate and drank. While they were enjoying themselves, the men of the town, a depraved lot, had gathered about the house and were pounding on the door. They called to the aged owner of the house. Bring out the man who has come into your house so that we can be intimate with him. Now, the word in uh, Hebrew is that we may know him. But we know from other places in scripture, the word no is very often used with sexual connotations. The owner of the house went out and said to them, please, my friends, do not commit such a wrong. Since this man has entered my house, do not perpetrate, perpetrate this outrage. And then look what happens. On the one hand, we have this fellow, an older man, not like the Benjamin Mites. He's much kinder. He's bringing this fellow into his house. But then look what happens next. Look. Here is my virgin daughter, 
and his concubine. Let me bring them out to you. Have your pleasure with them. Do what you like with them, but don't do that outrageous thing to this man. So first of all, you see that these man, men want the man and it's talking about sexual relations. So they're clearly interested in some kind of homosexual rape of this man. And for the, the, this man, for the, both for the, 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 the guy from Bethlehem, Bethlehem and the guy who, who came from Ephraim, both of these people think that that is the most outrageous thing. But sure, here's two women, take them, rape them, do whatever you want with them, which in and of itself is one of the most outrageous things you can see. Uh, but the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and pushed her out to them. They raped her and abused her all night long until morning, and they let her go when dawn broke. Okay, this is as far as we're going to get today. But I want to now just take the story we just read, and I would like to refer back to another similar a story that rings very, very closely to what we just read. And that is in Genesis 19. The story of the angels who go to Lot in Sodom. Okay, so let's just worry a couple of these, the verses that I think are relevant. Okay, we'll start with verse one. The two angels arrived in Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to greet them and bowing low with his face to the ground, he said, please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house to spend the night, bathe your feet that you may be on your way early. Okay, very similar to we have this elderly man coming in. He sees the man sitting and he immediately welcomes him. So both stories start out great. Lot is welcoming to these two men. And this elderly man is welcoming to the fellow who has just come from Bethlehem. Um, and we have uh, in verse two, um, the angels respond, uh, no, we will spend the night in the square, but then he urges them and, and encourages them to come in. Very similar this idea of staying in the street or staying it's in, in the Hebrew, it's the exact same words about sleeping in the street. Uh, we have a similar situation with the fellow from Bethlehem in, in Judges where, you know, he says to him, don't sleep in the street. OK, so we're both both situations to people that are would otherwise be sleeping in the street. OK, um, now let's look at, at verse uh, four. In, in Genesis, verse four. Uh, they had not yet lain down when the townspeople, the men of Sodom, young and old, all the people to the last man gathered about the house and they shouted to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may be intimate with them. It's exactly the same thing. The people of Storm want these men. The people of Gibeah want the guest. Um, okay, and continuing, verse verse. Uh, Continue verse six. So Lot went out to them to the entrance, shut the door behind him and said, I beg you, my friends, do not commit such a wrong. Look, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let me bring them out to you and you may do to them as you please, but do not do anything to these men since they have come under the shelter of my roof. Almost the identical thing. The older man in Gibeah says, I have my virgin daughter and this one's concubine. Take these two women and do with them what you please. And the same way Lot who until now we thought is a really great guy. Look how kind he is and he's welcoming, etc. He's protecting his guests. But at what price? He says, take my daughters, two daughters, just take them, rape them, do whatever you want, okay? But here comes the major difference. Um, uh, they, in both cases, the, the people out there are not satisfied, okay? They don't, they want, they want next to them. Um, and it, they both say no. But what happens next? If we look here at verse 10, but the men stretched out the hand, the men being the angels or whatever, the people who come from Abraham, but the men stretched out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And the people who were at the entrance of the house, young and old, they struck with blinding light so that they were helpless to find the entrance. So here we have supernatural assistance. If we're up to Lot, he would just throw these girls out and hope that that would satisfy them. In this case, the angels saved the situation by pulling back Lot and closing the door. However, in this in the story in our chapter, it doesn't work the same way. 
In this case, the 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 man from Gibeah, instead of of uh, closing the door and locking it and protecting his friends, he takes the concubine and he throws her out. And he says, "Here you go." And they raped her all night long, and they left her for dead at the at the at the at the entrance. Okay, and I think that it's not a coincidence. Okay. The, the story here is described as much as possible to give us an understanding of what's going on here. Even the finest person in Sodom who is locked because he's hospitable and he's kinder. Okay. And even this fellow, and he's also an outsider. That's very important. Lot is really not of the people from Stone. And in fact, in, uh, in, in G- Genesis 19 verse nine, the people of Saul said to her, here, you're suddenly coming to live among us as a stranger. You can tell us what to do. Okay. In the same way, we know with scripture, make sure to tell us that this fellow in Gibeah is himself an outsider. He's not a Benjaminite. He's from Ephron. He's living there. So we have two outsiders that are definitely distinguished from the others and that they're kinder, and more hospitable. But when it comes to how they're treating their women, it's terrible. Lot is willing to give his daughters and is only saved by the angels. And uh, this guy from Gibeah, nobody saves this young, this, this concubine, and he sends him out and they rape her all night long. And I think this is already tells us something. We know Sodom, what was the, what was the, uh, what was the, the, the lot of Sodom was to, you know, the whole st- town is destroyed. All the people are destroyed and it's, it's fire and brimstone. Uh, Lot is saved, but Lot is saved. I guess there's a small amount of dignity left in him, but he doesn't come to a very good end. Uh, the, you know, he was willing to give up his daughters at the end of the story. He's sleeping with his own daughters. Um, it, 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 that tells you something about the level of these people. And I think the, the echoes back to the Lot story here are to tell us this, these, these Gibeah are horrible people. Okay. And even this fellow who seems to be the better of the bunch, is are, are, is really horrible people, and that you know that that kind of sets the scene. So that we see what happened. This is a terrible story, and it goes from bad to worse. So that's today's lesson. But happy to hear what anybody has to say. Any questions, etc. Just it says something that God is prepared to still work amongst human nature, at such a place as today as well. Yeah, but this is pretty bad. I think what the what this is telling yeah. us is how how bad it can get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not. It's not. These are not uh, actions or behaviors that we are supposed to learn from in any way. <laughs> it's to tell us how horrible wow. this is but and how the, how low can people sink. But there's not another f- sort of flood as it was before. Right. No, 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 no more floods. We don't even have another Sodom. Okay, but mm-hmm. but we will have the destruction of Benjamin. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. That will come. And the question is, was that a good thing, a bad thing? Should have gone to that kind of um, uh, extreme. And these are the kinds of things that we will discuss as we continue with the story in the next few weeks. These are also very much the, the sort of things that are very, I think a lot of Christians find very difficult to uh, discuss, you know, how could this happen? And, and it, it, it makes people very wary of what the Old Testament says sometimes. Is this the God that was, you know, it, it can have a very um, difficult effect on people. Are you talking about Sodom or are you talking about here? Well, in general, the sort of the things that are happen, happening and, and uh, um, I don't know what other thing, but it, it, it gives people a, a difficult understanding of who God is in these Well, I think that scriptures. one thing we have to remember is that God created man with free choice. Yeah, yeah. He gave him the ability to choose good, but at the same time, he gives him <coughs> the ability to choose evil. And man choose evil, evil things happen. Mm. And of course, the question becomes, what did this concubine do to deserve such a terrible end? That indeed is a, is a very important question. And we don't know. We, we don't know. It's impossible to work something like that out. And that is a question that constantly echoes with us as we see, look, we all know bad things happen to good people. And we see that from Bible times to today. And we that's seem to be heading, question. we seem to be going back towards paganism in today's, in the world today in general. Well, you know what? I think if we 
look at the Bible, if we look at history, I'm not sure that we're going back to anything. You know, it, there were always people <laughs> who were righteous and there were always people who were evil. And sometimes you may get the impression that evil is gaining the upper hand. And that, of course, is very depressing. But it's usually some kind of pendulum sort of thing. I don't know that today uh, there is a you know combined evil that is greater than the combined evil of uh, 50 or 100 years ago. I mean, don't forget the Holocaust took place just, you know, 75, 80 years ago. So, you know, we have to keep our perspective. Um, but I think what the Bible is telling us is that God created and decided to work with human beings that are far from perfect, you know, and even the most righteous people sin. And here we have very evil people. And the question is, what are the consequences? And I think that becomes the very important issues that we're um, dealing with. Pi, on a re really related topic, one thing that's always puzzled me, why people like Solomon were able to have multiple wives because we live in a culture of one man, one woman. I just wonder whether you could comment on that. Well, that definitely was not the case in biblical times. Um, you know, there are many, many stories of people that had wives and more wives and Solomon had way too many wives and scripture criticizes that but the ability of man of a man to have more than one wife was something that was very common and uh, we don't see it particularly frowned upon in the bible although you might say that jacob kind of got into trouble because he had four wives but you know but but again it's clearly something that's totally acceptable so we have to say that things change that there was a, a different way of looking at things and, and things did change lynn i see that you have your hand up <laughs> <clears throat> yes, it's, I mean, and, Dave, and following on from this gentleman's comment, and David, the trouble that caused by having wives from different sons, but following on from Pauline's comment, it rather strikes me that it shows that God is just and true mm. in the way he judges because we see the wickedness and it shows God's righteousness in yeah. judging this wickedness. Even Which, if it yes, takes a while. <laughs> yes, yes. But we, he's, he's so long-suffering, isn't he? And full of grace. Yes. And mercy. That, that's, that's the amazing thing, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Diane. Um, well, back to the, to the wives. I, I'm sure I remember um, the fact that Jacob went to get a wife. It was in his mind to, to have... A wife, one wife, right, and right. and through circumstances, um, got involved and ended right. up with with four of them. Right. But I think I think generally it, it was something that almost expected of a king because he had to make all these different treaties and alliances with other nations and and um, having many wives um, was something that was accorded um, almost maybe even expected of, of a king. Sort of a political it, thing. It, yes, yes. There were many, many circumstances involved there. And, um, and it's interesting because the Bible specifically says in Deuteronomy, there are two, and I, I don't have time to look it up right now, but two different things. First of all, in Deuteronomy, there is a discussion of uh, if a man will have two wives, one he loves and one he hates. Yes. Okay. So implicit in that is that here is a very problematic family yeah. situation. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that's so easy to happen. If you have two wives, you're going to have conflict. Uh, you also have in Deuteronomy about the king. You have rules for the king, one of which is he should not have too many wives. Now, it doesn't say he should have, he should only have one wife. But like what you're talking about, and this is really where Solomon fell, because it was mm. absolutely acceptable in the ancient world. <clears throat> the way of having diplomatic relations was to marry the, the daughter or the princess from whatever country. And so Solomon had like hundreds of wives, a thousand wives. And, you know, and that and scripture then makes it very clear that this they let him astray. They yes. led him astray to pagan worship. So even though it was perfectly acceptable, the Bible in Deuteronomy tells us a king of Israel should not be doing this, you know. So, again, you think of Solomon, the wisest of all men, and all these wonderful things about Solomon. Even Solomon ends up sinning. I mean, human beings are human beings. And, and, and the Bible doesn't disguise any of this or doesn't try to whitewash any of it.
you know? Mm-hmm. And, and people are complex, which is why we see these people here, both Lot and this fellow here, they have decency. And yet when it comes to their attitude to women, this is when they really have a real problem. It doesn't that show a lack of trust in God on the king's part on David to trust by having these political alliances, they're not trusting. So that's why Israel shouldn't have done it because they they should be trusting God to lead them and not well, I think I think there's a delicate balance here. I, I think God does not expect us to sit back and wait for God to, to run the world. <laughs> People are expected to make ordinary human human uh, decisions. Mm. I mean, David was expected to lead wars and not wait for God to kind of wave, wave his wand. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Solomon was expected to solve human problems with human wisdom and intelligence. But there is a balance. And I think that's what scripture was saying to a king, you shouldn't have too many wives. Somehow you have to figure out a way on the one hand to carry out diplomatic relations. On the other hand, not to have too many wives. And and that of course is a challenge to figure out how to obey God. And at the same time, be part of of the normal handling of affairs. Isn't that the balance we are always, we're challenged with to this day? The same thing? Yes. Or to understand how the will of the Lord is to be worked out. For instance, with Jacob, um, he had to marry Leah because from Leah came Judah. Right. There had oh, to be a sure. Judah. Right. <laughs> right. And, right. And he had to have a baby with, with Rachel because from Rachel came Joseph. And it was through Joseph they got down into Egypt and they had to go down into Egypt to be delivered out of Egypt. <laughs> right. so, no question. You know, no question. It's just, well, and in no biblical question. times too, wasn't like having the multiple wives and the concubines uh, an act of mercy in some instances? Because without a husband, they would right. starve to death, essentially. So, I mean, it, it really was, a, you know, if a woman was without a family or without a protector, she was toast. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Right. Which is exactly why I think in our story, we see the father very happy that the man came back for his concubine because she would be in a very difficult situation if he hadn't come. Uh, on the other hand, he's well aware that she's not being treated the way she should and that his solution is to try to hold on to them. So there is this balance even then. You Definitely a woman wants to get married. In the ideal situation, There would be one husband for every woman. He would not only look after and protect her, but treat her well. And, and, you know, and so, but of course, again, we go back to what happens when human beings don't do what they're supposed to do, you know, and and we're still in the same thing, but there is, there is no ideal here because people don't live up to ideals, you know, and, 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 and this is the challenge that we all have and what the people in the Bible had, how do you retain your, your proper behavior and your dignity and do what's right, even if you are living in complicated situations. Yeah, I mean, look at Naomi. She was left without a husband. I am saying the message of the Bible. <laughs> through <laughs> and through. Right, right, right. Oh, and, you know, and, and Naomi, what a difference. I mean, she wasn't looking for a husband, but it was clear when she brings that she wants Ruth to go after Boaz because she sees in him yeah. two things, to bring her into a status, but also economic sustenance yeah yep, right yeah and and it's ve- and she sees that you know very nice that she's going and mm-hmm. gathering up the the remnants in the field but that's not a, a, mm-hmm. that's not sustenance and she mm-hmm. sees that boaz can really pr- pr- provide that protection mm-hmm. um so yeah that's definitely part of it hi sandra i want yes to- um, Hi, it's very interesting to mention when they when they, King Solomon, the wisest of all men, a, um, uh, a, um, uh, mm-hmm. that he it's written that he wahav nashim nochriyot. Yeah, that he liked people, a, a women, foreign, women, foreign women, foreign, foreign women, foreign women. Yeah. right, right. No question. And look, we talked about Samson. Samson began doing yes. some great stuff, but what did we say? He's always looking at the women. Yes. He's looking at the women. He's chasing the skirts. So, you know, these these are <laughs> these are known failings in men. No offense, men. Uh, not all <laughs> men are like this, but these are failings that many men have. And 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 the Bible is not whitewashing it. This is really this yeah. is what happens, you know. Right. Yeah. Anyway. 
Great discussion today. Thank you so much. Okay. We will resume our study of this horrible story next week. Brilliant. Okay. Please, God. Bye-bye. 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 I hope you enjoyed that film. And we have lots more film content and emails and articles that I'm sure you will enjoy as well. Check out our website at cfoic.com and subscribe to our newsletter. You can do that right from the homepage. I know you will really enjoy the content that will land in your inbox on a regular basis. Hope to see you soon.